Hey all, so this is going to be a quick screencast on how do solutions form. And we're going to specifically look at the formation of aqueous solutions. So that is solutions where the solvent is water and the solvent, I'm sorry, the solute is an ionic compound. So the first thing that we need to start with is the water molecule. And we all know at this point, if you don't, then you shouldn't probably be in this class, that a water molecule is a polar molecule. So if I have my oxygen is the blue fella, and these are my two hydrogens, actually I may maybe make those into little red H's, I know then that I have a positive side of my molecule up here and a negative side of my molecule up here, making this polar. And that doesn't mean that it's charged in any sort of way, because obviously there's no net charge associated with this. But we do understand that there is a difference in charge across the molecule. And this is going to be an important piece in our understanding of how things actually dissolve. And by the way, the process of something dissolving is called solvation. Not salvation, but solvation. Okay, so that's the name of the actual process of dissolution or dissolving. And the other thing is, when we talk about ionic compounds, we understand that ionic compounds dissociate into their individual independent ions. So if we take something as simple as NaCl, we know that this was created when a sodium ion, an Na+, came together with a chloride anion, and then they fused together to become the NaCl. Now, we understand that that's what happens when you form sodium chloride. What happens when you break it apart, and in some sense, you reverse the arrow and make it go in this direction? How do you bust it apart, and what is the process involved in that? Well, let's begin with this idea that when you take a look at a, a, a salt shaker and it's filled with salt crystals, know that these salt crystals are cubes, right? And if we are to zoom in on these cubes, like let's just zoom in here and take a look at this, we would actually see that if we could, if we had a scanning tunneling microscope, we would see that it was alternating sodium and chloride ions. So I'm going to pause it and I'm going to write this whole block of sodium, alternating sodium and chlorines, uh, chloride ions, and then I'll come back on. Okay, so we can see here I have sort of a checkerboard of sodium and chloride ions cruising around, or stuck actually in this block, and um, they all hold together through these electrostatic connections, the positive and the negative being attracted to one another. And we have water suddenly surrounding a crystal of salt. So don't forget here that if I'm going to be drawing my waters, let's we'll go back to drawing it like this little sort of Mickey Mouse looking like things. In fact, I'm going to make a whole bunch of these. So I'm going to pause it and come back. Okay, so I have four water molecules kicking around in this situation. And understand that the ion right here, and the one right here, and the one right here, they're sort of tucked away, and they are in some sense protected from the whole solvation process, uh, because water can't get access to them. Let's imagine that we actually have a chloride coming out towards you here, a sodium coming out towards you here, and another chloride ion coming out towards you, and then one going into the screen at each one of these places, and etc. all over the place. So you could imagine there's sort of an outer shell of sodium and chloride ions on this cube. So if we cruise back to this cube here, the surface of the cube is going to have the exposed sodium and chloride ions, or sodium and chlorides, um, and the center will be, in some sense, protected. And at least initially it will be. So what happens here is, don't forget here, that we have the positive side and the negative side associated with each one of these water molecules. And each one of these water molecules then cruises around, right? And it would swing around such that, let me spin this dude around, the 
negatively charged side of the molecule, whoops, didn't mean to shrink it, would then come in contact with the sodium, the positively charged sodium. So I would do the same thing for all of these. Hold on a second, do I suck or what? Sorry about that. This is, I just reversed it, right? This should be the negative, and this is the positive side. Okay, so you can see here that you could have a whole bunch of water molecules surrounding that little corner sodium right there. It's not just two of them. It would be as many as could possibly fit around that sodium ion, and they're all sort of negatively charged. They're the negatively charged side of the water molecule sticking to the sodium. And don't forget that the water molecules have a very strong, relatively speaking, but strong intermolecular force that exists. And at some point, all the, the hydrogen bonds that exist among all the water molecules can actually overcome the attraction that the sodium has for the surrounding chloride ion. So you can imagine there's this attraction that exists there, the ionic bond there, but if you have enough water molecules surrounding any one of those sodiums, it's actually going to be stronger and it'll be able to then pull away the sodium ion away from the network of sodium and chloride ions. Just like that. And then of course the same thing is happening on the other side. So we have water molecules surrounding the sodium ions and pulling them away. And then you could imagine a set of water molecules surrounding, and it's going to be the opposite now, it's going to be the hydrogen side of the water molecules surrounding the next things, which are the chlorine ions. And so the chlorine ions get surrounded by water molecules. Those water molecules are powerful enough such that they eventually pull away these chlorines or chloride ions. Right? And so they get surrounded by water molecules, and then the whole affair continues until the whole thing has been completely stripped away. Now, what's important here is that you have enough water molecules to be able to do this. Once you don't have enough water molecules, you run out of them, then there aren't going to be enough water molecules to tug against the sodium and its attraction to the other chloride ions around it. And so then you're left with the salt crystal hanging down there at the bottom doing nothing. Now it just so happens with sodium chloride that you actually don't need that much water. It's actually amazing how much water is in any volume of water and how much they can actually overpower the connection between the sodium and the chloride ions. Okay, so eventually the whole thing gets pulled apart and then you have little jackets of water surrounding the sodium and the individual chlorides, preventing them from being able to rejoin or re-anneal into a solid crystal of salt once again. All right, hope that makes sense. Bye.